I think this is uh, the tenth year that um, this seminar has been held, which is uh, fairly impressive. Um, and uh, the Hearing and Balance Centre here has been uh, on campus at the St Vincent's Hospital for now 18 years. Um, and it's, uh, it's a pleasure and an honour to be involved in the team because um, there's not that many places that have a comprehensive approach to hearing and balance and uh, uh, a, a medical backup. Um, so hopefully uh, we can try and achieve uh, the best sort of results in uh, uh, stabilising hearing and, and balance problems here at St Vincent's. Now, um, I'm going to give a talk um, that might sound a little bit dry, but I've found it very fascinating. Um, and uh, I've, uh, I've inherited this talk from Professor Fagan, so if it's exciting, I'll take the credit. If it gets a bit boring, I'll, uh, I'll blame my, uh, my senior colleague. So um, we're just going to go through a few slides, and, um, uh, and I'm going to show you a few pictures. Now, this is something that we all uh, uh, have a, an awareness of, but basically, um, this is just a, a schematic diagram of our ear. Um, and as everyone knows, the ear is made up of an external part. So obviously the, we call this the pinna or the external ear, the ear canal itself. The eardrum and the three bones of hearing which transfer a sound uh, uh, energy into the inner ear and the inner ear then sends that signal up to the, uh, up to the brain that gets processed in further ways. Now, it's fairly amazing that this has actually evolved at all, um, but it all starts back um, from uh, when we were uh, organisms swimming in the ocean. That's what we'd all like to see when we look in someone's ear, a perfectly normal eardrum not uh, obstructed by wax or uh, other pathology. Again, hopefully we might be able to um, show you down your own ear canal uh, down the track, but this is basically us putting a little telescope down into the ear canal and a, a normal looking eardrum, a bit of wax there, which is always uh, actually a good thing. And we can see when we pinch our nose and blow it against a blocked nose, air goes up through a little tube from the back of the nose into the ear and the eardrum pops out. So that's basically just a picture of the ear working as perfectly as it possibly can. Now this is a bit dry, but basically the whole idea of the ear's uh, uh, hearing mechanism is to pick up sound. And there's a few sort of terms we use in terms of sound. The first, which is frequency. Now, frequency, um, from what we hear, we perceive as a pitch, so high pitch and low pitch. And the ear is uniquely designed to uh, uh, pick up a, hu a very wide range of pitches. The intensity or the loudness, we measure in decibels. Um, and I'll mention that again in a, in a little bit. Um, but it, it's a very complicated system. So when we say um, someone's hearing uh, is normal, where basically uh, the pa person's able to pick up a sound that's very, very small, so up to zero decibels. Uh, and when you look at your, your hearing test on a graph, when you see zero on the, the hearing chart, zero is not in fact zero hearing, but it's perfect hearing because it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a reference point to the absolutely perfect hearing. Now, again, this uh, harkens back to high school physics, but basically, this is just a representation of a sound wave. Um, and in fact, as sound travels through the air, the little particles get compressed and relax and compress and relax. So this is the sound wave that the ear eventually picks up and transforms into an electrical signal and sends it up to the brain. Now, just to give you an idea as I was talking, zero decibels is, uh, if there's a sound at zero decibels, it's something that we can probably just hear. So it's uh, the very faintest of sound. 10 decibels is rustling leaves. 20 decibels is someone whispering at you from one meter away. Um, 60 decibels is someone having a normal conversation about uh, a meter away. And it also corresponds to the amount of hearing loss you have if you have no conductive mechanism. So if we all put our fingers completely in our ears, like this, that's a 60 decibel hearing loss. Um, or you don't have an eardrum, or you're missing the, the, the conductive component of your ear, you'll have a hearing loss of 60 decibels uh, if the nerve underlying your ear is completely normal. And then as we go even louder, 90 decibels is the sound of a pneumatic drill. And to give you an idea, and 
this is where the youngsters of today are, are endangering their ear, that basically a nightclub uh, set no noise is about the same as a chainsaw. So we're running about 100 decibels. Um, so uh, these days we would never dream of um, chainsawing uh, uh, in the backyard without any ear protection. Uh, but a lot of people are now spending hours and hours in nightclubs also without any ear protection. So whilst industrial problems from hearing are going way down, recreational problems from excess hearing loss is, is starting to elevate again. Now again, back to some, uh, some high school physics. These are just uh, wave forms representing sound. And basically, the higher the frequency, um, the, the shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency, the higher the pitch that we're hearing. And the larger one of these waves that we measure, the louder the sound is going to be. So just to sort of summarise, the ear itself is designed to do a number of things. One, it's to transfer a, a acoustic uh, into a, me a mechanical signal. So a sound wave coming out of my mouth is travelling through the air, so there's a sound wave compressing the air, it's hitting your ear and making the eardrum vibrate microscopically. Um, then the eardrum and three bones of hearing transfer that sound into the inner ear, so there's a mechanical function, and then the inner ear transforms that piston or that movement of the bones into an electrical signal that sends it up to the brain. So uh, it's quite amazing that more problems don't happen with that system. Now, how did it all start? So that's just a, a diagram describing that, sending it down the ear canal. The eardrum is vibrating and also protecting things from coming from the outside to the inside. And the inner ear, as I said, is transforming that mechanical energy into an electrical signal. So from the very beginning, uh, as when we started as little fish swimming around in the ocean, we didn't really have a hearing apparatus, but we had a balance apparatus. And from the balance apparatus, the hearing part of the ear has evolved. So I don't know how many uh, of you know about the biology of fish. Um, I didn't know much at all before I started re researching this talk. But basically, um, fish have a thing called the lateral line. So coming from the head all the way down to the tail, uh, are little um, dimples and basically those dimples are connected just under, this, um, under the scales to a pressure regulating system. So as they move through the water or another fish swims by or a big shark's coming to get them, they can sense a pressure change uh, and that uh, works via a system that is now very similar to our inner ear mechanism now. So as that pressure changes um, a little hair cell moves and sends a signal to the brain telling the fish, in this case, that there's something nearby and it might want to do something about it. Now, that worked okay in the water, but as the fish turned into amphibians and started to take our first steps out of the, the mud and onto the land, Obviously that system wouldn't work because there's an air and a fluid interface. So um, this is a diagram uh, or a picture of the Queensland lungfish. Now that's probably the closest living uh, relative to the, or the, the fish that were just evolving to step out of the, uh, uh, of the ocean onto the land. Um, and we're talking about 365 million years ago, so a fair, a fair while ago. Um, and the next step along that line were things called the tetrapods. So tetrapod just means four legs. So they started to just be able to crawl out of the water. Now, what um, the tetrapods started to develop was a middle ear or an ability for the sound that comes through the air to be transferred into the inner ear. Um, so they started to develop an eardrum and a bone of hearing to transfer that pressure wave. Now, this is a diagram just saying that air-water interface is very difficult. And we can't, we can't come back to that 60 decibel uh, uh, number that without a middle ear and external ear mechanism, 
we all of a sudden, as I said before, if we cover our ears completely, we're only sensing the sound coming straight through our skull. So it's vibrating the inner ear directly without any advantage from having the external and the middle ear apparatus. Um, and again, what's happening at this air water interface is that most of the energy just gets uh, uh, rebounded and only very little, so one in a thousand of that sound uh, energy is actually transferred into the inner ear itself. So without a, a good functioning external and middle ear, we would be struggling from a hearing point of view. And again, this is just a very uh, good way of describing. So if, you, if you're underneath the water swimming, or if you're a shark, and someone's clapping their hands above the water, you hear very little of that. But if you can clap your hands or transmit a sound in the water itself, where you don't need a middle ear, you can hear that really quite well. And in fact, sound waves travel just even a little bit better in water than they do in air. So as the uh, fish and amphibians started to claw their, ways on, their, their way onto land, um, we, the, the first uh, um, type of animals were the reptiles. Now, the reptiles um, had a bit of an eardrum, but they only had one bone connecting the eardrum to the inner ear. Um, now, mammals, like we are, have developed three bones. So, each of those extra bones that we have in our middle ear allows us to amplify that sound a little bit better. So our conductive hearing uh, ability has become progressively better. Now, um, the difference between a reptile and a mammal is that um, two of the bones, so uh, of those uh, of the ossicles we call them, uh, have have come from the jaw joint of the reptile. So. Again, this is a picture of a reptile. So these coloured areas here are parts of the jaw joint. And over, again, millions of years, these bones have become smaller and smaller and smaller and have been integrated into the, uh, into the middle ear cleft and have allowed us a much better functioning system uh, from a, a hearing perspective. Now, this is another diagram, but basically this is a reptile's ear. And there's an eardrum and just one bone that's connecting the eardrum into the inner ear. And this is now the, what we, we have now, the stapes, or the, the last of those bones which acts as a piston. And over, as I said, millions of years, the, we now have two extra bones here that allow us a, additional amplification uh, into the inner ear structures. Um, this, uh, if you're really into trivia, is the uh, Yanokonodon, which is the first of um, the mammals to actually start developing these extra bones. Uh, and this was 125 million years ago. Now, the middle ear now, uh, again, is a very efficient uh, uh, way of processing or amplifying the sound. Now, there's a couple of things that the, the middle ear does. There's a hydraulic effect, so we've got an eardrum. Now your eardrum is probably about the size of your uh, little finger's um, fingernail, to give you an idea. So as the sound comes in, that vibrates. It gets transferred through these three bones of hearing. And then this last bone goes in and out like a piston. Now that last bone, the stapes, that has, uh, a, uh, it's about two and a half millimetres by about one and a half millimetres. So the size difference amplifies the sound coming through those bones. There's a lever system with these three bones uh, amplifying the sound. And just the shape of the eardrum itself, which is a little conical, also amplifies that sound as well. Now, this is quite amazing, but the, when the sound hits the eardrum, it's only vibrating by about the, the, the size of a hydrogen atom. Now, a hydrogen atom is uh, 0.1 nanometers across. Uh, and basically, just to give you an idea, there's one million uh, hydrogen atoms in one millimeter. So when we think we can you know, uh, see the, the, the eardrum vibrating when it's uh, receiving sound, we can't. It's basically microscopic at the very smallest level. This is just a bigger picture of those three bones inside our, uh, inside our uh, middle ear clefts. And this here 
is the stapes, the last bone, or the stirrup as some people call it, and that area there looks pretty big on this slide, but is only about two and a half millimetres by one and a half millimetres in size. And again, that just gives you an idea of the size of our uh, uh, middle ear bones in comparison to the size of a, 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 a matchstick head. Now, whilst all the, uh, the middle ear and external ear was developing, what was happening to the inner ear? So the inner ear is the, the cochlea and the nerves of hearing. Um, again, over millions of years, um, the cochlea initially was just a duct. So it was very crude in its ability to absorb the sound and transfer it into an electrical signal. But over millions of years, as we can see in these pictures, this is the cochlear initially, but it's now um, to save space and to pack in much more uh, processing power, like computers have become from huge to tiny little uh, um, uh, computers, it's now curled up on itself. So now, uh, as you can see, it's quite uh, straight and now a much more modern looking cochlear, it's basically curled upon itself so we can pack thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, sensory cells uh, into a much smaller area to improve the ability of the ear to transfer those signals. Over time, how the cochlear duct has become progressively more curled up and now it looks a little bit like a snail, basically, when we look at it uh, under a microscope. Now, this is a picture of the inner ear, so inside the cochlear itself. And basically, um, as the last of those bones vibrate and sends a pressure wave down into the uh, inner ear, a pressure wave comes up here, comes around, and comes back that way. And what happens is as this pressure wave is coming, this membrane here moves microscopically, but it moves just a little bit like this. And as that membrane moves, there's little hair cells, thousands of hair cells inside the inner ear. And as that moves, like a wave, those tiny little hair cells move just fractionally. And as that hair cell moves or uh, gets bent, it then opens an electrical signal and sends it up to the brain. And that's what we eventually hear all the way up here. Now, there's two types of hair cells. These outer hair, three rows of outer hair cells, which we've got uh, about 12,000 of these. And the job of those hair cells is to fine tune. So basically, as I'm talking, those little hair cells are working to tell you different frequencies and to uh, fine-tune a signal into the inner ear. Now, the problem with these, and a very common cause of hearing loss, is that if those, hair, those outer hair cells get damaged, the ear is then unable to distinguish between different frequencies. So the ear still may be able to hear a sound, but it can't distinguish between low and high, and the quality of the sound that's going to the ear is significantly impaired. Now, this is an electron microscopic picture of a row of these tiny little hair cells. Um, and essentially, it might sound overly simple, but as that membrane moves across these hair cells, it gets bent and sends a signal and sends it to the brain. And as higher beings or humans, um, it's now our brains that are processing all these signals coming in uh, that has basically been able to uh, allow us to develop language skills and all these other things that lower mammals have been un unable to do. <coughs> this is a slide, so we've uh, sliced it very thin, and you can see the, each one of these little dots here is a cell. So this is a very, very delicate structure. So again, any minor trauma or damage to the inner ear structures can certainly make a big difference to one's hearing levels. And this we go even smaller still. So we see um, the rows of outer hair cells and inner hair cells um, at, a, at the very most microscopic level. Now, as I was saying, the, we've been talking about the cochlea here uh, and the sends a signal up to the brain. So this is where the human brain then starts taking over.
because there's a number of different nerve pathways once this, the signal has left the, the cochlea that are processed and allows us much higher hearing function. So our ability to appreciate music, uh, directional sense where two ears are, are working together to absorb sound. Um, and these higher functions as it goes up a series of different uh, nerve pathways finally reach the auditory cortex, so part of the brain that processes all these sounds. So very occasionally you can have a completely normal system all the way up to here and if there's some damage to the brain uh, at that auditory cortex level then uh, that can uh, uh, um, it makes uh, the brain's ability to process and receive that sound uh, completely impaired. Now as I said if we go back to sort of uh, why we investigate the ear, um, hearing loss can happen uh, due to a problem or damage at any part along that process. So we divide those things up into a conductive problem. And a conductive problem basically is any issue that is from the middle ear outwards. So whether that be from a big lump of wax sitting here, or a hole on the eardrum, or one of these bones not working properly, um, uh, or fluid in the middle ear, that's going to be a conductive problem and any inner ear problem or nerve or sensory problem is from this area here all the way along the nerve pathways and up to the brain. Now, we're talking about the evolution of hearing, so our ears have become amazingly efficient but not prone to disease unfortunately. So where is the evolution from here? Now evolution obviously happens over millions and millions of years, but our ability to help correct hearing, while far from perfect, has evolved over a very short period of time. So what is going to happen into the future? Um, at the moment we can, uh, for instance, put a, uh, an electrode or a wire or a cochlear implant into the uh, inner ear to bypass a lot of the normal problems. So maybe in 100 years time or you know, if we give ourselves another 125 million years, how good is our, uh, our hearing function going to be? So maybe in 50 years time, everyone who's got normal hearing, we supplement it with an implant or uh, someone, you know, you wear a, the, a microscopic little chip and you drop it into your ear canal and not only do people with normal hearing uh, get enhanced, but people who've lost all their hearing, uh, we may be able to restore at some point in time. <coughs> Now ideally, what we'd love to be able to do is to inject something into the ear, so a stem cell or some form of uh, uh, a growth uh, process that will regenerate the normal pathways. But unfortunately, uh, I'm sure I'm probably too old to benefit from that. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I think everyone in the room from, a, from a, the magic, uh, uh, the holy grail of you know, stem cells and other things from an inner ear point of view, I think we're all probably too old. Maybe my children's children might be able to benefit from that. But in the much shorter term, we're stuck with you know, minimising disease, minimising all the, uh, the environmental problems associated with hearing loss, uh, and trying to optimise our techniques to boost hearing at this point in time. But uh, perhaps at some stage, uh, we will become uh, part uh, biology, part machine, to completely enhance even someone who otherwise has you know, completely normal hearing. Um, and uh, I know Sarah is going to talk about this in much more detail, um, but this is a picture of a wire or a cochlear implant within the inner ear itself. Um, now normally these are things we only do in people who have fairly poor hearing to start with, but as I said, as techniques improve, um, maybe everyone will have a little chip sitting in their ear uh, that's giving them supersonic hearing or you know the old fable of the babel fish you pop in your ear and you can understand everyone talking so maybe uh, uh, it will develop into a stage where we don't even need to worry about learning another language because that little chip in our ear is going to do it for us. Um, so um, I've sort of come to the end hopefully that trip wasn't too uh, too boring through the evolution of hearing. Um, does anyone have any questions at all?